Well, you might want to have your Bible open at uh, John in chapter 9. If you have a Bible in front of you, John in chapter 9. As you may be turning back to that, though, I'm going to read from Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. Uh, Daniel was a, a prophet, uh, but he was also a man who uh, was a Jewish man who uh, reached a very high position in the Babylon court and then in the Persian court as well when the Jews were taken into exile a few hundred years before the time of Jesus. Uh, Daniel's famous for being in the lion's den. But the second half of Daniel is full of visions. And I'm going to read to you uh, one of them. And then we'll turn to John 9. It's a vision where Daniel sees uh, the Ancient of Days. That's another name for God, God the Father. The Ancient of Days. Daniel speaks... As I kept watching, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white like snow, and the hair of his head like whitest wool. His throne was flaming fire, its wheels were blazing fire. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from his presence. Thousands upon thousands served him. Ten thousand thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was convened and the books were opened. I watched then because of the sound of the arrogant words the horn was speaking. As I continued watching, the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to the burning fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was removed, but an extension of life was granted them for a certain period of time. I continued watching in the night visions. And suddenly, one like a son of man was coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was escorted before him. He was given dominion and glory and a kingdom so that those of every people, nation and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. Quite a description, isn't it? Quite a description, almost a frightening one, actually. In terms of its overwhelming power and majesty and and might and dominion and so on. And it's supposed to be overawing. Daniel, when he saw the Son of Man coming to the Ancient of Days, was overawed. Scared, terrified, in fact. Let's go back to John chapter 9 now. We'll come back to Daniel 7 at the end. On Sunday mornings we've been uh, looking at a, a series of encounters that Jesus had with different people. Uh, we've seen Jesus have an encounter with a man called Nicodemus. Uh, Nicodemus was a very respectable Jewish man. He was a Pharisee. He was a, a leader and teacher of the people. He was someone who was looked up to. Uh, but he came to Jesus at night. Uh, not just night outside. It wasn't just dark because the sun had gone down, but it was night inside Nicodemus' heart. He needed Jesus to switch the lights on. The one who is light and truth. And then last week uh, we saw Jesus have an encounter with a woman from Samaria. Uh, Now whereas Nicodemus would have been a, a very respected man who would have had no problems thinking that Jesus would speak to him after all he was a teacher of Israel uh, the Samaritan woman was an outsider at least she, she definitely considered herself an outsider as far as a Jewish man like Jesus was concerned. And she was stunned when Jesus spoke to her. But Jesus did. Uh, Jesus spoke to this woman. He knew all about her, it turned out. Including the bits that perhaps she didn't want people to know about. But that didn't put Jesus off from speaking to her, welcoming him, welcoming her and offering her salvation as well as the Messiah. Uh, This morning, we're looking at an encounter with somebody else again. This time we're looking at an encounter 
with a, a blind man. As Jesus was passing by, verse 1, he saw a man blind from birth. Now, Nicodemus would have been respected. Uh, the Samaritan woman would have been shunned by most Jews. The blind man was judged. People looked at the blind man and judged him. You see that straight away in verse 2. Jesus' disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind. So right from the start you see that this is a man who is used to facing judgment. He can't see people walking past him, but he can hear them. You'll have heard what the disciples said. And no doubt the disciples weren't the first to say it as they walked past. This was a commonly beheld belief, it would seem. If someone's blind, if someone has some sort of physical disability, what did they do? Or what did their parents do? How did they sin? It's their fault. So this morning we're going to think about what does Jesus say to the person who feels judged? And perhaps judges themselves as well. What does he say to them? Well, interestingly, the first thing that Jesus says to this man is, is this. Your blindness is not your fault. Your physical blindness is not your fault. Uh, Jesus is very quick to answer his disciples in verse 3. He says, neither this man nor his parents sinned. In other words, stop blaming him and or his parents for his physical blindness. Don't do that. I don't think Jesus is saying they've never done anything wrong in their lives. These are perfect people. What are you on about? That's not his point. His point is that they've not done anything specific that led specifically to this man's blindness. Now, I don't think actually we, we live in a culture here where people presume when they see a blind person or a person in a wheelchair or, or someone with some other disability or illness, oh, they must have sinned. And we probably don't live in that sort of culture anymore. We perhaps used to, going back a few decades, centuries, but, but not so much anymore. Glenn Scrivener's book will tell you why we don't think that way anymore. If you're interested, it's at the back. We don't think that way anymore because we've been soaked actually in a, a Christian worldview and culture. And Jesus taught, no, you can't draw a straight line between someone's suffering and a past sin that they've committed. At least normally you can't. I guess sometimes you can. If a drunk driver drives into a tree and ends up paralysed, you can draw a pretty straight line between his sin and his disability, can't you? True. But most of the time that isn't the case and we shouldn't assume it has been. Perhaps, though, we do look at other people who their lives are a bit of a mess and they're in a bit of a disadvantaged situation. I think, well, it must be something they've done. Perhaps they can't get a job, or it must be their fault. Perhaps they haven't got any qualifications, or it must be their fault. And so on the list could go. Well, actually, it, it may not be. There may be all sorts of reasons why that has happened. We shouldn't be quick to judge. We shouldn't. And Jesus isn't here. He says to the man, it's, it's not your fault. He knows the man will hear that, as he tells his disciples. We shouldn't be quick to judge and assume why people are in the situations they're in. Secondly, though, he has something else to say to him. And again, I'm sure the, the man overheard this as Jesus said it. And I think it's a word of encouragement for people who, who do find themselves disadvantaged in some way. Who perhaps do struggle with illness or injury or some other problem that they just cannot seem to overcome. He says in verse 
3, second half, and verses 4 and 5. Or particularly verse 3. This came about so that God's works might be displayed in him. I think as we go on in the Christian life, we learn the truth of that statement, don't we? Uh, the Apostle Paul learned the, the truth of a statement like this. He had his thorn in the flesh. He had some sort of physical disability, it would seem. And he prayed many times that the Lord would take it away. Now, you might think the answer to this is going to be that the Lord did, and glory to God, he took it away. But it worked differently with Paul. The Lord didn't take it away. He said, my power is made perfect in your weakness. I will work through you, even though you have that thorn in the flesh, and that will bring even more glory to me. And Paul was, yes, Lord. Sometimes, of course, he does work miraculously. And he does heal. We prayed earlier in the service, didn't we, for, for a number in our fellowship and connected that God would, would work in them. That he would heal them. Sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't. But, in the lives of his people, however he works things out, it's so that his glory will be displayed in them. So, first of all, the blindness isn't your fault, he says to the man. This physical problem isn't your fault, but it will be used for God's glory. And the way he uses it for God's glory initially is to heal the man, isn't it? So, we, we read the account earlier. Um, he says in verse 4, We must do the works of him who sent me, that's his, his father, while it's day. Night is coming when no one can work. That will be after Jesus returns. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. It's interesting, isn't it? Light. He's going to bring light. He said these things, he spat on the ground, he made some mud from the saliva, he spread the mud on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. So he left, washed and came back seeing his neighbours and those who had seen him before as a beggar said, Isn't this the one who used to sit begging? Some said, He's the one. Others were saying, No, but he looks like him. He kept saying, I'm the one. So they asked him, How were your eyes opened? He tells them, Jesus does a miracle. Does a miracle. He can do that. Isn't that wonderful? We absolutely can pray to God that, that he would heal people when they're ill. Uh, we absolutely can pray that, that Sid would get his speech back. And God can do that. Jesus can do that. We absolutely can pray that Elaine would get the right treatment and be made well again. Uh, that, that Becky, if the lump she's found isn't benign, that she would get the treatment and God would heal her. We should pray that and so on and so forth and in this case he healed he healed him glory to God but that's not where this incident ends is it in one sense uh, you might think we would get to I don't know just the end of verse 7 and we've heard all we need to hear Jesus is someone who won't judge, someone who has some sort of physical disability or other disadvantage. He won't judge them. He will intervene and heal them. End of story. And often I think that's how perhaps we or others might perceive the, the Christian faith and what Jesus does. As if this were the greatest good he could do. Now, I have to be careful in the way I say this because this is a good thing. And one day when Jesus returns and he brings in the new heavens and the new earth, there, there won't be any more suffering. It will all be gone. Every tear wiped from every eye. One day he will do that fully. But there's something more important going on in John 9 than just the opening physically of a blind man's eyes. What we need to see is that the blind man and everyone needs to be able to spiritually see not just physically 
So he's told him your blindness isn't your fault. He's told you him your blindness will be used for God's glory, and it kind of is as he opens the man's eyes. But he still doesn't say this in so many words, but it's the implication of all that happens. You need to see spiritually. You need to see spiritually. So as I said, sometimes we perhaps get the picture that, that the person that Jesus is and why someone might want to come to him is simply because he's a, a healer. He's a healer. He can physically heal us of our diseases and he can. And he can and often he does and praise him when he does. He, he physically healed this man. But as we'll see, we need so much more than that. What begins to develop as this passage goes on is really a question of who is Jesus? That's what the passage is really all about. Who is he? Jesus will end up saying to this man, you need more than just a healer. That's a message that we need to hear. It's a message our world needs to hear, isn't it? Uh, What do we wish for the people that we love? I just want them to be healthy and happy. Perhaps you've said that. Perhaps I will. I just want them to be healthy and happy. And I just pray to God that that's what they'd have in their life. The problem with that can be that that health, physical health, becomes the ultimate end in life. It almost becomes God. What's the thing that I think people around me and I, myself, most need? Physical health. Mental health. Health. Now, it's not unimportant, clearly it isn't. Jesus heals this man. One day he'll return and he'll restore people to full health in a resurrection body. But it's not all that matters. It's not even the most important thing. We need to see in this passage that Jesus is more than just a healer. Let's not ape the world and chase health as the ultimate goal. By the same token... If you're unwell, go to the doctor. (laughs) God in his kindness and his goodness has given us doctors. But it's not the ultimate thing that we need to be telling people about. That we need to believe ourselves. Secondly, though, we need to know he's more than just a prophet. As this uh, whole story goes on, uh, you get to verse 13. And you get this whole controversy that develops between the blind man, uh, the Pharisees, and even the the blind man's parents get trapped into it as well, don't they? There's this whole debate going on about what's happened. And the debate isn't really over whether Jesus has has done this so much, although that is there, as they try to establish whether he really was born blind or not, and whether he really has been healed, but they get to the point of establishing that. The, the, The argument really is, who is Jesus? Who is he? So the Pharisees are stumped. Because, well, okay, Jesus has opened the eyes of a blind man, but he did it on the Sabbath. You can't do it on the Sabbath. It's breaking the fourth commandment, they say. But some of them were not quite so sure. Verse 4. Others were saying, how can a sinful man do that? If he really is a sinner, breaking the Sabbath, how on earth has he managed to heal someone? So there was a division even amongst the Pharisees. So they asked the man, what do you say about him, verse 17, since he opened your eyes? I guess that probably came as a bit of a surprise to the man. He didn't consider himself much of a religious expert, I wouldn't have thought. So he says, well, he's a prophet. Uh, We read from Daniel earlier. Uh, Daniel is counted as one of the prophets. In other words, he spoke God's words. He was God's messenger. And he brought God's words to the people. 
And it's interesting, the man doesn't initially identify him as a healer as such, he identifies him as a prophet. Although, of course, there were Old Testament prophets like Elijah and Elisha who did miracles. Maybe that's who he's thinking of. He tries to find someone in his religious knowledge of the Bible that Jesus is like. Well, he's a, he's a prophet. He must be like an Elijah or Elisha. He comes and speaks God's words and then miraculous things happen. Is he right? Well, yeah, he's right. Yeah, Jesus is a prophet. Jesus is someone sent from God to speak God's words. Just like Jesus is a healer, he is a prophet. But as the passage goes on, we'll see that he's so much more than just a prophet. He's more than Elijah. He's more than Elisha or Daniel or Isaiah or Jeremiah or any of the other prophets in the Old Testament. He's much, much more. It's interesting where the debate goes next. <clears throat> We've had the mention of how can a sinful man perform such signs. And in the verses that follow, uh, the Pharisees begin to get very self-righteous, or at least some of them. They get very, very angry, and they get very, very uh, self-righteous. So by verse 24, you've had the incident with the parents who want nothing to do with it because they don't want to get chucked out of the synagogue. You get to verse 24, so a second time they summoned the man who had been born blind and told him, and they've got things horribly mixed up here, haven't they? Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. Well, if they want to give glory to God, don't call Jesus a sinner. The, the man gives an honest answer in verse 25. It's also an answer that shows he doesn't yet fully understand who Jesus is. Yes, he's a healer. Yes, he's a prophet. But he's not got everything. He answered, whether or not he's a sinner, I don't know. At least he's honest. But I do know that I was blind and now I can see. It wasn't... John Newton, who originally wrote those words in Amazing Grace, it was the blind man who said them in John 9. I once was blind and now I see. So they say again, how did he do it? I already told you. And then I think, I think he's, um, he's starting to get a bit, I don't know, I've had enough of these guys. I'm going to have a dig back. <laughs> it's quite funny what he says in verses 30 and following. He said, this is an amazing thing, he told the Pharisees. You don't know where he's from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners. He's made his mind up now. I do know he's not a sinner, actually. But if anyone is God-fearing and does God's will, he listens to him. Throughout history, no one has ever been born blind. Opening the, no one born blind has ever had their eyes opened. If this man were from God, he wouldn't be able to do anything. He's grown very confident. He even says at one point, you don't want to become his disciples, do you? Do you? He seemed very interested in it. But there's all this talk about sin. And it ends up in verse 31 with the Pharisees furious. You were born entirely in sin. They replied. I think there's that judgment coming out there as well, isn't there? What do the Pharisees say to the man born blind? Well, you were born entirely in sin. Look, you were born blind. And you're trying to teach us. There's an irony in what they say, though. Because in one sense, verse 34, they're correct. The Bible teaches, actually, that since the fall of our first parents... Adam and Eve, back in Genesis 3, every human being is born in sin. Every human being is born with a fallen, sinful, blind heart. Now that's not what they meant here. But they spoke truer than they knew in another way. 
thing was, they were born entirely in sin too. I was, you were, everyone out there too. We're all born with our hearts turned away from God, not towards him. Now they weren't having it, they threw him out. That means they threw him out of the synagogue. They say, you're not allowed to have fellowship with us as God's people. Off you go, out. You may never return. His parents had dodged that fate earlier, hadn't they, by just clamming up when they were questioned. But this man just, he's out with it. It gets him chucked out. The Pharisees were thinking of God's people. So, what next? Jesus has made it clear, or I will make it clear now, I'm not just a healer, I'm not just a prophet. But this man has a problem now, he's been chucked out of the synagogue by people saying you were born entirely in sin. What will Jesus say last? He says to the blind man, the judged man, I am the son of man. I am the son of man. Look at verse 35. Jesus actually had disappeared off the scene, having sent the man to the pool of Siloam to wash the mud off his eyes. <laughs> he knew what he was doing. He knew what would unfold next. Uh, back in those earlier verses, he sent him off to the pool, verse 7, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. So he, that's the man, left, washed and came back seeing. But Jesus is not there anymore. The neighbours start chatting to him, then the Pharisees start chatting to him, then the Pharisees judge him. Then Jesus comes in verse 35. Jesus heard that they had thrown the man out, and when he found him, so he went looking for the man, he asked, do you believe in the Son of Man? Now, that's a question that we might assume he just wouldn't understand at all. Because if we asked it to most people out in the world, and maybe to some of us, do you believe in the Son of Man? We would go, I've never heard of the Son of Man. What does that mean? But I think the blind man would have at least heard of the Son of Man. So I think his question in verse 36, who is he, sir, that I may believe in him, is not a question of, well, I've never heard of the Son of Man, but more, I, I have, so, so who is he? Because being a, a Jewish guy, he would, have, he would have heard the book of Daniel. This is back to Daniel. He would have heard the words read out that we heard earlier. As I kept watching, thrones were set in place. And the ancient of days, that's God the Father, took his seat. His clothing was white like snow, and the hair of his head like whitest wool. His throne was flaming fire. Its wheels were blazing fire. In the Bible, fire is a picture of judgment. Fire judges. A river was flowing, coming out of his presence. Well, that's a, a symbol of life. Thousands upon thousands served him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was convened. Oh, a court. What happens in a court? Judgment. That's why courts exist, isn't it? To judge. The court was opened, convened, sorry, and the books were opened. These are the books of who's guilty and who's not. I watched them because of the sound of the arrogant words the horn was speaking. As I continued watching, the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given, given over to the burning fire. A judgment is coming. As the rest of the beasts, their dominion was removed, but an extension of life was granted to them for a certain period of time. I continued watching in the night visions. Then suddenly one like a son of man. This is who Jesus is referring to in John 9. Jesus heard that they had thrown the man out. When he found him, he asked, do you believe in the son of man? Do you believe in the one that Daniel speaks of in Daniel 7? Daniel saw one like a son of man. 
He was coming with the clouds of heaven. That's a description of Jesus' return one day, isn't it? He'll come as judge when he returns a second time. Here comes the judge. He approached the Ancient of Days and was escorted before him. He was given dominion, rule, power, authority, and glory in a kingdom. So that those of every people, nation, and language should serve him. There will be those who will come to the judge and actually will not be judged. They'll know him as king, as lord, as saviour. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. His kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. But every other kingdom will be. The Son of Man is a powerful, and to Daniel as he heard this, as he saw this, a frightening figure. It's God's judgment coming. Yes, it's also him coming to claim his people, but to judge the rest. Do you believe in the Son of Man, he asked him. Well, well, who is he, sir? So that I may believe in him, he asked. Jesus answered, you've seen him. In fact, he's the one speaking with you. Now the man's response shows us, I think, that he knew his Old Testament. He did know Daniel. Because his response to hearing that the Son of Man was speaking with him is verse 38. I believe, Lord. And he worshipped. You worship God. You worship God. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment. Now these are comforting words to the man because he's been judged all his life, hasn't he? He's been judged by everybody walking past him and talking about him and saying, well, what did he do that is blind? He's been judged just now, even though he can see now, by the, the Pharisees, you were born entirely in sin. Get out of the synagogue, you're out of God's kingdom. Now here's one who says, I'm the one who came into the world for judgment. It's me. The Son of Man. But I came in order that those who do not see will see, and those who do see will become blind. What on earth does he mean? Well, he means this the ones who do not see will see are the ones who recognize the blindness in their hearts. In other words, they're the ones who recognise that, yes, they are sinners. And they're the ones who recognise that they can't see their own way to God. They're the ones like this blind man. He's a picture of that. And Jesus says, for those who know that they do not see, I'll give them sight. I'll open their eyes. To the truth of their own sinfulness, yes, but also to me as the light of the world. So they're saved, so they won't be judged. I will take their judgments on the cross. The judgment will still happen, but I'll take it for them. For you, he's saying to this man. But the flip side is, <coughs> those who do say, do see, will become blind. Now this is the Pharisees, and they hear this. Don't they? In verse 40, some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and asked him, we are blind too, are we? Now, I think that, I'm guessing, I think that might be the son who said in verse 16, how can a sinful man perform such signs? Because there was a division amongst them, wasn't there? Not all the Pharisees ended up rebelling against Jesus. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was converted. There's some who, who actually are trying to figure out what Jesus is saying. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and asked him, we aren't blind too, are we? Jesus' answer basically is yes. If you say we see the way to God without coming to the Son of Man, without coming to me, if that's what you say, you're, you're actually, you're blind and your sin remains. Again, we need to understand that. 
How are you seeking to avoid Judgment Day? Because it's coming. This passage is about judgment. It's not just about light and dark and blindness. It's all wrapped together. It's, it's about judgment. Jesus will return one day. Have you seen that? Have you seen that he is the judge? But he's also, as judge, the one who can declare you not guilty. If you trust him. To forgive your sin. To open the eyes of your heart. And bring you into God's kingdom. The wonderful thing for this man was that even though the Pharisees thought they chucked him out of God's people, Jesus brought him in. They turned out to be the ones on the outside who couldn't see. He turned out to be the one on the inside who could. Is that you? Have you? Have you looked to Jesus as the one who opens the eyes of your heart and forgives your sin? Should we pray?